Coming from a different world and only being a politician for a short period of time, how am I doing? Am I doing okay? I'm president. Hey, I'm president. Can you believe it, right? Yes, he is. That was President Donald Trump in the Rose Garden after the House health care victory, seeming to relish his remarkable rise to the White House. And on this holiday weekend, we wanted to take a step back and talk to some of the people who followed Trump through the years. Was his rise to the Oval Office predictable? What does his past tell us about what Trump's future holds? I sat down on Friday with Gwenda Blair, author of The Trumps, Three Generations of Builders and a President, the definitive family biography of Donald Trump. Timothy O'Brien, author of Trump Nation, The Art of Being Donald, which takes a close look at Trump, the businessman. And our Tom Yamas, who covered the historic Trump campaign every step of the way for ABC News. Gwenda, I want to start with you. You've, you've known Donald Trump for how many years? Started working on my book in the late 80s. And, and how do you think he's changed? Not a bit. Not a bit. He is exactly the same guy. He's been doing the same thing for 40 years, and it works. He's got that laser focus on the market, or now on the, in, over the campaign, on the voters. What do they want to hear? That's who he is. He's a salesman. And his best product is himself, and he's really good at selling it. And, and Tom, you covered him every single day on the campaign. I, I don't think you really knew him before, but no. you saw him right away do exactly what Gwenda's saying, sell himself. Do you think he's changed? Are you surprised that he's not different in office? You know, he's 70 years old, and, and for the better part of his adult life, he's never had a boss. He's always been the boss. So he's never had to listen to anybody. He's never had to really evolve in his views. And right now, I don't care how great of a tactician, how brilliant of a political scientist walks into that Oval Office, whatever they tell Donald Trump, he's going to do what he wants to do. And that's what he did through the campaign. And I agree with your point. He is his best spokesperson. And that's maybe the only part of his presidency so far that has hurt him, is that he's had messengers come out, whether it be Sean Spicer or Sarah Huckabee Sanders. The best salesman for Donald Trump is Donald Trump. He's always his best mouthpiece. And I think by taking him away from the press, by having lack of news conferences, that's not Donald Trump. Donald Trump loves a camera. I, I remember the campaign trail. We could be anywhere. And the staff would say, no interviews. He's not talking to you. As soon as he sees that camera and that red light turn on and a microphone, he makes a beeline to you. It, it, it empowers him. I think it, it, it actually strengthens him. And it's something he's good at. And I think they're doing a disservice by keeping him away from the cameras. I would depart from Tom on the notion, though, that, that if they let Trump be Trump, that's the best thing to do because he's a good spokesman for himself. I think he is a good source of energy on the campaign trail. It's why he got so much attention. He's this force of nature. And he's uninhibited. He's essentially Mr. Id. And he runs around saying whatever is on his mind. And, and he loves being on the campaign trail when he can be the source of attention. The second he's not, he, it's like a vacuum is lifted out of the room. I'm not sure that it's, it, he is his best salesman, but I think there's also something to having those spokespeople out there. And then he can jump in and be the distraction from whatever it is that they said. So he's got this kind of perpetual motion, distraction, I mean, story, a, distraction, story, distraction, story, distraction, story, distraction. So he's got us all covered. And if it was just him, you know, he wouldn't get that thing, that tension of that, of that back and forth distraction story, distraction story. I think some people sometimes put too much into this, oh, it's all Trump's strategy. It's his right. grand plan. Right. And I think what he loves about the cameras, what he loves about the TVs, he's a man who doesn't have vices. He doesn't retire at night with a cigar. He doesn't enjoy a nice glass of scotch. What he loves is getting in front of that camera and, and just grappling with reporters and going back and forth. I used to see news conferences that would be half hour, hour long, where he was just getting nailed with tough question after tough question, and he'd finish, and he'd be in a good mood. And any other politician would be demoralized, but he was okay with it. And, but when I look at the past few months, the past four months, and you, and you look at some of the things that President Trump has done. This is a man who watches cable a lot. He watches the Sunday shows. He, he is aware of everything that's going on on the air, and yet didn't seem to understand that firing James Comey would be a, a big problem on, on both sides of the aisle. Even though he watches television all the time, even though he 
you would think absorbs how it's covered, that seems to be an area that they are not very good at. But I don't think he absorbs media strategy. His strategy is to be in front of a camera. It, it, it sort of begins and ends there. And he reacts, he doesn't respond. So whatever that spur of the moment decision is, he'll do it and it's very hard to talk him out of things. I mean, staffers who know him, who have been with him for years say it's very hard to talk him out of things. You have the Comey firing, but you also have when he announced the tax plan and that caught his staff like <laughs> completely by surprise. He said, we're gonna have it next week, something to that effect. And they weren't ready with it. Turned out it was one page long. So, so if you were on his staff and you wanted him to listen to you, what would you do having watched him all these months and years? What would you do if you were a staff member to try to give him advice that you just knew he had to take, that you just thought was so important? He'd play to his ego. I mean, that, that's the only way that, that I think you can get things through to him. I mean, a, a lot of ways I think some politicians here in Washington have understood a way to get through to him is to compliment him and that's a way into Donald Trump because the one thing you can't do with him, and I know this very well, is you cannot criticize him because if you ask a question or you criticize him publicly, he's at war with you. And, and you have personal, <laughs> he, he called you a sleaze. I asked him a tough but fair question if he had a problem with the truth, if sometimes he exaggerated things. It was during that news conference when he had mentioned he had raised $6 million for vets in Iowa. It turned out that was not the case. And I asked him, I said, do you sometimes stretch the truth? Your critics say, you know, you, you have a problem with the truth. And he got really upset. He called me a sleaze. He got over it, but he has very thin skin. Tony Schwartz, who wrote The Art of the Deal, who has been talking quite a lot about Donald Trump over, over these months and years, says he sees a sense of self-worth that is forever at risk. I think that's totally true. Where does that come from? I know one of the things that people will say is it's his father. You met his father. Tough guy, that dad. <laughs> Relentless, ruthless, yeah. Yeah. worked 24-7. Took the kids around to the building sites. To collect nails. To, to collect nails. <laughs> yeah, why would you waste that? He was always looking for a way to save an extra dime. Last minute, any kind of negotiation, signing a contract, dad would stop it and chisel off a few more cents. Tough as nails. I want you to tell me the story about Palm Beach. You, you have an anecdote in Palm Beach that you said <laughs> told you a lot about Donald Trump. The president and I flew down to Palm Beach on his jet uh, from Manhattan. This was in around 2005 with Melania. We had dinner together. Um, and uh, during the day, he had taken me around Palm Beach in his Ferrari. And he would put the window down at stoplights and he'd say, watch what happens. And then the window would come down and people would point at him from the sidewalks or from the cars and he'd put the window back up. Anyway, we had dinner that evening and afterwards we were standing by the pool and there were probably a dozen speakers that were almost as big as me, six foot, speak, six foot high speakers. And Donald was cranking classic rock and really loudly. <clears throat> and I'll have to, he, he swears quite a bit, so I'll tell this story in a, in a clean TV safe way. But he leaned over to me at one point and he said, you know, when I moved here to Palm Beach, nobody wanted me around. And I love cranking this music as loud as I can because it bugs the heck out of all of these so-and-sos, and I love it. And I think that, you know, he didn't have to go to Palm Beach. So the interesting thing here is he chose to go to Wasp Heaven and buy an estate there. And, but then he got there and he rejected the norms of Wasp Heaven. Uh, and I think that that's explanatory of a lot of uh, motivations in his life. He wanted to get out of Queens to come into Manhattan. He, he wanted to be accepted by the real estate class in Manhattan, but then he thumbed his nose at them. He wanted to run as president as a Republican. Uh, I think part of him wanted the Republican establishment to approve him. At the same, in the same breath, I think he thumbed his nose at the Republican establishment. And I think that little moment by the pool in Palm Beach speaks to all of that. I had a, a, another experience with him in Palm Beach that was earlier, and this was in the 90s. And it was in West Palm Beach, which is, of course, not... This, the swanky part, when condo towers that he had bought, uh, and he put his name on them, of course, <laughs> and tried to sell apartments in them, the bank foreclosed, these units were put up for auction. You might have thought that it was an embarrassing situation, not for him. He walked around the auction, chewing on Tic Tacs, greatest day of his life, telling everybody that this was a marvelous opportunity, they would be really happy, it was gonna work out great for everybody, no problem, it was all terrific. And I was just 
sort of dumbfounded. I, I want to move to Ivanka Trump. He clearly has a, a close relationship with her. He clearly admires that young woman. What do you think of that? You know, he comes from a family business. I think that's the only way he knows how to do business. And I think he feels very comfortable with having a relative in there. Because I think he knows at the end of the day, as loyal as some of his staffers are, and he, and he has staffers that are, are much more than just employees. I mean, they, they essentially are family to him too. But, but blood is thicker than water. And I think he always needs to have someone there. And in his eyes, clearly, he sees Ivanka is the heir to the Trump dynasty. His sons did a great job during the campaign. They're running the business right now. I just spent some time with them. They're staying busy. But Ivanka clearly is the heir to the throne. He wanted to bring her in. And it's like any other business deal. If she can learn something from this, he's going to bring her in. And she's going to help him. And she's also going to learn some experience, too. I, I, I want you to tell me what you think the best part of Donald Trump is. What's great about Donald Trump? What is good about Donald Trump from what you've seen? I'll say this, and it is, I believe this to be a, a true testament of how people are elected. They always say the beer test. Would you want to have a beer with this person? And even though President Trump doesn't drink, he is a lot of fun. He is funny. He's charismatic. And if it was in this small group or an audience of 30,000 people, he wants to be liked and he works hard to, be, to <clears throat> want to be liked. So one-on-one, -on -one, it's hard not to like him. I think his humor, his optimism uh, are definitely his strengths. I think he's a survivor. I think people have always underestimated how tenacious he can be. I also think there's a Jekyll and Hyde element. He's a very different person, I think, one-to-one -one when he's out of the public eye. Uh, um, he can be a, actually a pretty good listener. Uh, he can be very open to talking about almost anything, uh, which is part of the entertainment value with, with him. Uh, but that transforms when he gets out on the public stage. He wants to win. There's a certain op possible flexibility there. Um, he, he, he'll, he'll reframe it and move it around and turn it upside down. But at the end of the day, he wants to win. And so he will be flexible on things. He is kind of practical, finally. He wants to make it work out. And he doesn't want to lose. Will he run again? I think so. I mean, I think, he, that, I think the, the best part for him as far as enjoyment was the campaign. I think he loves one of those rallies. It's the closest he can be to, to a rock star. He walks in, the music's blaring, people are cheering for him. All those people are there to see him, and he loves that. I think he'd like to be president for life if, if, if the world allowed it. I could see him running four or five more times. I, I think he has no intention of going away. Um, reality, some investigations, the electorate all might intrude, uh, but I don't think he thinks about it that way. He did say that he would only need one term because he'd fix the country in four years. He did say that on the campaign That's trail, right. So. <laughs> Absolutely. He's the most competitive guy who ever lived. Uh, and this is the biggest gold ring there is. He's got it in his hand. Why would he let it go? And he is already tweeting again this morning.